and then diffused into all aspects of cultural production. So I'm interested in the science for sure, but I'm also interested in the way that it gets used and that process of the translation that occurs and the way that it then gets implemented into art, particularly architecture and design, but also into political policy, social visioning, ideas of democracy, all of these other things that are going along right now, especially with this idea of kind of self-organization and emergence, which is part of complexity. Um, all right, so in terms of, kind of getting started here, I decided to call my talk tonight metaphor, ideology, or process. And by process, I simply mean like a tool, like computation that's used both within the sciences and by artists and architects and designers. Um, uses of evolution, genetics, and eugenics in modern and contemporary architecture and design. So in a pretty short period, I'm gonna try to summarize for you an argument that I made out of my dissertation and also introduce my current research just to, I, you know, I get my 30 to 40 minutes to meet you guys here in this way. So. I'm going to try to accomplish a lot. Um, so if I cover things kind of superficially, hold your question, if you will, until the end, and then hopefully we can have a great discussion about this. Um, the book on the left is the book that was my dissertation, and it's my only uh, monograph. Um, Eugenic Design, Streamlining America in the 1930s. And it's an argument for late Art Deco design to uh, reinterpret it and understand it as derived from in interests on the part of designers in evolutionary theory, and in particular in eugenics, as kind of a broad-based ideology that was suffusing kind of all aspects of American culture. Um, out of that, that research, I ended up having to argue that eugenics was in fact popular in the US in the 1930s, because most histories of science dispelled that. They either focused on the scientists, and there was definitely a transition happening from eugenics, the pseudoscience with bad methodology, into genetics, the supposed good science that had good methodology, but lots of the same people and the same ideas and values and goals made that transition pretty intact. So I had to kind of write for myself kind of a popular history of the belief in eugenics. And out of that, I ended up having more ideas than was in that book. There's also other scholars who started researching this. And so with another colleague from England, I, we co-edited this book that came out with other essays on eugenics in the US in the 30s. Um, my current work is not focusing on the 30s, but it's using that as a kind of a benchmark or a historical context to look at the ways that evolutionary theory and genetic practices are being suffused into architecture and design today. Um, the images that you see here, the one on the left is uh, a book that comes out of the Genetic Architectures Program in Barcelona that Dennis Dollins teaches at, and there's a number of, of kind of, I think, go-between between, between the U.S. and Barcelona and the Architectural Association in London, where they're really pushing this idea of kind of collaboration with genetic engineers, also using genetic algorithms and computational processes to create kind of living buildings. So I'll be talking about that a little bit more. Um, and then on the right is just one example. It's from Foreign Office Architects, and it's their phylogenetic tree of their architectural projects. And it's just one example of the ways that architects are trying to use biological classification systems literally as a model for how they're thinking about their own projects. Um, the other thing that I will bring up is there was just a show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York that just closed called Design and the Elastic Mind. And a couple of the pieces that I'm going to show here were included in that exhibition. Um, I went to the show when it opened uh, about a week after it opened, and so some of the pictures are ones that I took. Um, they will really show the ways that Paola Antonelli was putting forward this new idea of collaboration between the sciences and designers and artists. Um, the basis of the show was to look at nanotechnology, computational processes, ways of visualizing complex data um, graphically, um, as well as other types of kind of 3D visual systems. So it was a fascinating exhibition. There was also genetic engineering involved in some of the pieces in the show. So what I want to try to do is just show you, with like four images, what I'm calling emergent genetic architecture and design today. And this is the focus of my new research. Um, and so I'll, I'll do that. I'll follow it with a summary of my argument in eugenic design, because I think it's really important to have a historical comparison of a scientific belief system that then was suffused into the artist, to, to use as an example for thinking about what's happening right now. Um, and then I want to just raise some really big key issues that are kind of the focus of my new project that I think need to be talked about um, in any group that's trying to understand emergent genetic architecture and design. Um, in particular, with things that I am sensitive to after studying eugenic design of the 1930s. So, to get started, can you guys see that image? The light's a little bit rough. Do you see this beautiful gold thing? 
shimmering there in the middle. <laughs> it's called the Victimless Leather Jacket, and it's a genetically engineered um, leather, designer leather jacket grown in an in vitro glass chamber um, by Orincat Science Reserve, part of the Tissue Culture and Art Project in Western Australia. This was in the show at MoMA, and it's about two inches tall. It had a peristaltic pump, it had fluid. When I took the picture, it sure didn't look like it was getting fed at the moment, but I'll come back to that at the end of the, the, the talk. Um, it's a fascinating example of artists um, and scientists collaborating with each other, and the way that they rationalize it, or the way that the plaque discusses this piece, is they basically said, if we could grow our leather coats or other types of products that we want in a design sense, then we wouldn't have to have cattle, and we wouldn't have to have the devastation caused by cattle, so it's actually more sustainable to use biotechnology to grow products that are genetically engineered, and that would also supposedly curb our destructive consumer habits which I'm dubious about. But uh, I think it's a fascinating example. And it's a great example, too, of the combination of using biotech as supposedly a guise for sustainable practice, which is another really big issue, I think, when you're bringing these two things together. Um, another piece that was in the show at MoMA are these rings, bio jewelry. They're actually bone cells that were taken from two partners who were making a commitment to each other. They took bone from each. They grew them on the scaffold of these rings. They then inserted a precious metal insert, as if wearing your partner's bone on your hand was not precious enough. And here are these pieces. This comes out of the Royal College uh, of Art in London, their design interactions uh, program. Um, one of the other ways in which this idea of kind of using biotech ideas, but also just the imagery and the knowledge we're getting from, say, uh, here, electron, skinning electron micrograph images of spongy bone tissue, Architects are beginning to think about materials in new ways. And so they're literally collaborating with material scientists to try to understand how does the information in DNA create a human body, much less bone structure with hard bone tissue, soft spongy bone tissue, marrow, when it's all done by this replication process. And you end up kind of having a, something as beautiful as this that is highly efficient, um, highly economic in terms of its maximizing structural capacity and function but yet allowing nutrient supply as well through the, all of the holes that you see are where the marrow would be. Um, so it's basically saying nature has found a way to maximize beauty and structure, functionality, um, sustainability in terms of its use of materials. How can we use this as what I'm calling a new skeletal structure metaphor for architecture? You know, think about the skeletal structure of a Gothic building. This is taking it to a whole different level, trying to get down to the cellular level in terms of this type of self-organization and mimicking it then in architectural systems. The other thing that I think is fascinating is that while this kind of you know, theoretical transformation has been happening over the last 20 years within architecture, same for the technological production side. 3D rapid prototyping is allowing complex structures to be turned into 3D objects, beautiful like this. It's a two-foot base. That, well, I call it a base, right? It's not a base. A two-foot structure, sculpture, model. Um, that was in the MoMA show as well, done at, at MIT by Mary Oxman. Um, Basically, it's just as easy to print something as beautiful and complex as this as it is to print some, I mean, to 3D print something that would be like, you know, an I-beam steel structure where it's all at right angles. So you might as well use the computer to generate these forms, run it through the rapid prototyper, and end up with these incredibly unique complex forms. It's called mass customization as opposed to mass production. So you're seeing the shift in technological production capability happening at the same time. And I want to compare it to this large-scale high-rise that's actually going up in Dubai right now, where it's actually a 40 plus story skyscraper with very, very high end spaces for rent. So I think that the social economic side of it is very interesting. Um, it's made out of prefab concrete and glass. Each one of these is individually uh, produced in China, off site, shipped to Dubai and being constructed to create this building. And the way that the architects describe the aesthetics of this is that it's two buildings that are contiguous to each other that are fusing as one, losing their individual identities which in my mind is basically stay, saying the two buildings are mating. So you have this image of kind of sexual reproduction, if you will, of these two buildings that are fused together. So along these lines, these are four different examples of breeding, design that's been bred, whether it's on a computer, whether it's done with genetic engineering, or whether it's done in this kind of metaphor for visual sense where it, actually all of these processes are kind of being brought together. Um, and so this is what I'm calling emergent genetic.